Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 688. I did that without looking at the notes. That's that's so cool, George. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. Today, September 28, 2021. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. Yes, I will address the questions you sent to me in email. Uh, don't worry, but we got to do some stuff for... Yes, I know, I know, I know. I know. I know, it's been a couple days since we did a show. I'm sorry. I will address those when we finish the most important part of the show, and that's your participation in the show. I need you guys to like the show on Facebook or YouTube. You're going to see a thumbs up. I don't know why that is the uh, international I like the show button, but click it. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. You're right there. You, there's only two places you can watch this, YouTube or Facebook. Just click the like button. That helps George and I and makes this show a little bit more famous in the eyes of YouTube and Google. And they give us free advertising when you do that. We appreciate this. Please share this program with your friends, families, and foe. Please go to the comment section if you have any questions about the show or if you want to make a comment of what we're talking about. Or if you have nothing better to do except troll us. That's all done in the comment section so please go there to do that um, if you want to provide a link or something in the comment section youtube is set up to filter that out so if you have a good comment with a link let me know and i will try to approve it for you uh, we had some people trying to do links last week and oh no it won't prove well you gotta let me know we don't just let every link go through because there's heretics out there george it, it's it's a strange world <laughs> makes us famous so george um people are going where were you guys are you okay is 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 kevin on his deathbed are the, did the cats wake up one night and kill kevin where, or is george sick or why are you guys not recording this week and um i got 20 or 30 emails asking that question and we're praying for you and here's here's the short answer george doesn't say no to his daughters enough <laughs> you took an emergency trip, not an emergency trip, but it was probably planned, all the way to Philadelphia and back in 24 hours. Congratulations. What's the story there? Well, I caught the 7 o'clock flight out of Gainesville, Florida on Wednesday, uh -huh. arriving in Philadelphia at noon, because that's where my car happened to be. <laughs> my daughter uh, took a vacation from California and decided to go on a road trip she flew down to Florida and visited friends all along the eastern seaboard mm -hmm. and then left the car at Susan's mother's house, her grandmother's house. And I had to go get the car. So I flew up to Philadelphia, uh, had lunch with my wife who was visiting her mother, and then drove 16 hours straight back to Florida because from Friday to Sunday I had two funerals, a wedding, four worship services and a bible study on the chapter three of the book of revelations and so i was a little frazzled having had no sleep and trying to explain uh, the book of revelations with half a brain <laughs> no this is the part that's the dream okay okay no, uh, <laughs> no that's quite something you know, if if and this is me i raised my kids a little different if they said dad could i borrow the car my rule is you bring it back and even if it has a half a tank you return it with a full tank that's that's dad that's kevin's rule you know and it's worked well they don't borrow the car as much because i always give it to them with no gas i do the opposite of uh, uh of that parent uh, ch uh child relationship well the actual the the cost to rent cars these days oh, is so exorbitant uh -huh. that it was actually cheaper for all involved because at the end of the day, Kevin, even though my daughter is paying for it, that means, Daddy, can I have the money to do this? <laughs> yes. So it was, it was cheaper for me to buy a one-way ticket to Philadelphia from Gainesville and drive down uh, without stopping uh, for, for the night than it was to rent her a car for uh, two weeks to drive up and down the East Coast. No, the, the supply and demand in the rental market has just gone bonkers uh, because over COVID, Avis and all the you know budgets and everybody unloaded their extra inventory. They sold as much as they could to maintain a, their business in COVID times. And then lo and behold, 
who are coming out of COVID, they don't have any cars to rent and they can't just go buy cars because guess what? There's no chips to put in cars and uh, we're still having uh, chip shortages in the car market. So uh, they're all screwed, but they can always raise their prices. I have a friend who landed in LA, couldn't get a car. He ended up calling uh, U-Haul, getting a 20 foot eight or 28 foot truck and rented that for the weekend for his uh, uh, time traveling around LA because that's all he could get. And when it came down to it, it was a lot cheaper, like a fraction of what it would cost to uh, rent an Avis out of LA at the same uh, thing. So COVID times, George. COVID times. All right, so that's that's why we didn't record last week. George was busy with travel, and uh, you know none of us got sick. None of us had any more. Uh, well, okay, I'm, I'm a little sick. I found out I have a cataract, George, and it's slowly getting worse. I got oh old my. man's eyes. So, and if you spend more time in Florida, you'll get old man's skin like yeah, me. Right. With oh the, my gosh, you'll have uh, the dermatologist. And the and soon the orthopedist on speed dial uh, for your all your aches and pains. Sure, people ask where I am all the time, so I'm going to see if I can bring it up here. Bardstown, and we'll go here. Oops, don't want that. Just keeping it real for you guys. So we relocated out of. Uh, uh, Madison, visiting mom and dad, family, friends tour, and we are now in Bardstown, Kentucky, which is south of Louisville. We are here for the bourbon tour, and uh, with the bourbon tour, you get to go around to the distilleries, and they tell you how they manufacture the product, and they have it l l ha let you take little sips and taste as you go around. Um, you don't want to drink a lot of bourbon because it gives you headaches, but I do like the flavor of bourbon. I'm just not a a high level consumer like some of the people here in uh, Bardstown are. <laughs> I, I'm a one old fashioned and done guy. So, uh, but the, I like the flavor of Maker's Mark. I'm not gonna lie, you know, so. Well, next is next stop gonna be North Carolina. <laughs> we'll take the cigarette factory tour and We'll try menthols and okay. uh, cools our ne and our filters. Next, and uh, our next stop is actually going to be the Biltmore. Uh, we're going from here over to, is that, that's Asheville, North Carolina, right? Yes. Yeah, and so we're going to head out over there. We'll be doing that after we do Mammoth Cave, which is uh, south of here in Cave City, something Kentucky. Uh, so that that's that's all that so let's pull up and do our stories uh we're already like uh, eight minutes in we haven't done a story yet that really frustrates some people who just want the news so we got the news george we got a good news story and it starts down in texas what's the story the supreme court of texas has rejected the episcopal church's bid to keep the personal property of the fort worth churches that stayed loyal to 815. Now, we all remember the long battle over the little property, the buildings, when Fort Worth uh, left the Episcopal Church, uh, lawsuits were filed, mm -hmm. and the Episcopal Church set the battlefield. The field was all or nothing. So either Fort Worth wins everything, or the Episcopal Church nationally wins, wins everything. Well, the gamble did not pay off, and the Episcopal Church lost everything. However, when they began to vacate the buildings, they took the movable property with them in many cases. And new lawsuits were filed to get the movable property plus the bank accounts and other things returned. And the Texas Supreme Court has finally closed that door. And so all that property has to go back to the, the breakaway, I'm sorry, the ACNA Diocese of Fort Worth. Yeah, I mean, th that was reality, and I, I don't know why they did this. You know, they lost in court. The uh, Pis the Supreme Court said you need to vacate the buildings. The buildings belong to the ACNA loyal diocese now, and they stripped the churches of all the property. I was disheartened when I saw that. I, I couldn't believe that because I know in the opposite, when the ACNA had to leave the buildings um, in all these different dioceses, they left everything. Uh, we negotiated when we left to take a couple prayer books, the processional cross, and uh, a few th a few things. And the, the bishop said, yeah, take it. I don't care because um, I'm getting the building and I'm going to sell it right away. 
So we had a negotiation here. There was no negotiation with uh, the Fort Worth Diocese. Hey, can we take all the pews? Can we take the checking accounts? Can we take the prayer books? And, you know, it, it's like the, the end of uh, the Grinch Stole Christmas when all there is is a little crumb for the mouse. You know, just like, what's going on here? And uh, I'm glad the Texas Supreme Court stepped in. And hopefully there will be an end to this 10 years of working the legal system for the rights of the church to have uh, the neutral principles in, in force, George. Now, not every uh, 815 loyal parish did this. No. Not all of them. Some of them did, and some of them did it to an extreme level that I can only put down as being spiteful of short of taking the copper piping out of the walls they stripped the buildings um and some of these buildings have to do basically be re refitted i mean they were just made left useless um it's akin to having your some people when their car gets repossessed uh basically take it on one final ride to get it smashed up and pour sugar in the gas tank and just for spite try to hurt the person taking the car over because they're so angry and we saw that, which is unfortunate. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it's not. It's not unnecessary. It was not the church's greatest moment. Uh, certainly, uh, eight, not eight fifteens who could have said something early on. Let's do this right. They could have been good leaders in this. Maybe they were. I don't know. So, George, that was our good news story. The Episcopal Church um, has been told by the Texas Supreme Court to give it all back. Let's uh, move on to our next story. Um, we kind of alluded to this in a show or two ago that the. Uh, the Welshes approached Gafcon, the Welsh Church or Church of Wales, Wales. Oh, I don't know that. It's one that is the Church of Wales. Evangelical Fellowship in the Church of Wales. That's what in I the meant. Church in Wales. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. Okay, uh, approached Gafcon, and you know we want help. In fact, we want like an ACNA type option. And how is that going to look in the long run, George? Well, the general uh, governing body, the Church in Wales, adopted same-sex blessings, mm -hmm. liturgies for same-sex blessings. And the Evangelical Fellowship of the Church in Wales has been protesting this and trying to hold the Church of Wales in Wales to its historic traditional understanding of human sexuality and marriage. Well, they were un unsuccessful in the legislative process. And so its leaders contacted the Gafcon primates, and they're exploring ways forward. Now, they released a statement that is worded so that they can't get in trouble and be accused of defecting uh, when there's no alternative body to defect to that's been set up. But they did let, they did publish a statement that will hearten their supporters in Wales to say, look, we're looking at ways to go forward and be part of the Anglican world, be faithful to the scripture and doctrine as we've received it from our church, from the Apostolic Fathers. So, don't, friends, don't run away. So, what is, now, let's put two and two together. What is that way forward? Well, the only lifeboat out there really is Gafcon, if they wish to remain within the Anglican world. Now, there are groups in England, which is not Wales. People in America confuse the two. What? Uh, no. Anglican no. mission in England, <laughs> which really wouldn't work in Wales. No. Uh, for national reasons and other churchmanship reasons. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the exploration's beginning. Now, what will this look like? We can't say. What promises have been made? We, we're not privy to those. But the, the word the word that's being shared with at Welsh evangelicals is don't lose faith, hold fast. Um, a, a not a scheme, but God will see you through these difficult days and your faithfulness will be rewarded. Uh, Wales is in a very difficult place as a nation, as a, in the sense that religious fervor enthusiasm is at a very low ebb. And we've seen these in the past, and well, Wales has been the source of tremendous revival. And we may see that revival again. And we're praying that Wales, the God will use the Welsh Evangelical Fellowship to evangelize that country, to bring back the faith in its fullness and power among the ordinary people. Yeah. So it's so friends, we have no magic to announce that there's now a Anglican network in Wales. Nothing like that. But the 
lifelines are being tossed to the Welsh evangelicals from the Gafcon boat. Yeah. And we'll see see if they climb aboard. Yeah, and we'll see, you know, what it looks like in five years from now. Um, you know, these things take time. Nothing happens overnight. And there's so much minutiae you have to deal with when you're uh, dealing with the politics of Anglicanism at an international level. Um, otherwise, at, if it were easy, uh, the AMIE in England, that would be going full blast right now, and churches would be joining left and right. It's not easy. Church is hard. Well, one of the things in favor of bad leaders produce ex extraordinary results. Mm -hmm. The ACNA is here because of Catherine Jeffrey Shorey. Uh -huh. I am firmly convinced of that. If in the final vote, it was between her and Henry Parsley of Alabama if for the vote for presiding bishop, and she won by one vote. And John David Schofield and a bunch of other bishops of their ilk all voted for Catherine Jeffrey Shorey. Three or four that we talked to said, yes, two. we voted for her. Yeah. So if Henry, and the reason why is that if Henry Parsley had been elected, in, uh, and the Griswold era would have continued, which would have meant perpetual sitting on the fence. We wouldn't have had, we would have basically kept where we were. Some of the conservative bishops wanted to bring matters to a head, and they helped elect Shorey, and Shorey went then deposed all these people, and the ACNA was formed. There is a segment of the Welsh Church of, I don't want to call them radical feminists because they're not so much feminists, but they are radical power mad loons, kooks, who have almost a viciousness about them in their dealing with people who disagree with their financial worldview. And we saw this in the uh, order ordination of women and then the ordination of women to the Episcopate, that if you're not with us, you're against us, and if you're against us, we're going to try to do everything we can to destroy you. That mindset is in the among some of the leaders of the church in Wales, and that may drive the creation of, uh, of a second Welsh church. I think we learned really quick, George, that mutual flourishing, though desired, was a lie from the pit of hell. You know, I think you, you, the conservative says, we are mutual flourishing, we will agree to that. We can, we'll try to live with it, and you promise to help us, we will promise to help you. And in the end, it was only a one-way promise. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen, just the decimation of the Orthodox and conservatives uh, in the UK under, under the, the guise of mutual flourishing. Uh, it was mm -hmm. a lie. It was put forth as this is the way forward and you will see how well the church will be in in five ten fifteen years because we finally agreed to have women in, in the episcopacy and uh women clergy and where i've seen it work other places i would never hold the uk as an example of mutual flourishing no uh, because kevin is right the promises made have not been kept and there's no intention to keep them that we're able to discern from the leaders. Be, um, the, because there is that vicious element of nasty partisanship um, that is present at one level that needs to be appeased. The, the analogy is uh, not, the analogy could be the, United, the Democratic Party in the United States. Um, there are eight or nine Democratic congressmen who are really far left. Hmm. Um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, for example, but those eight or nine, because they because the party lines are so close, the Democratic leadership has to go left in order to get their votes to beat the Republicans in a, in any battle. So, the Church of England has that core. I don't want to say fanatic, but almost uh, core totalitarian liberal group that pulls the entire machine to the left in order to keep them on board and things get harder and harder each each year for the traditionalists whether they be evangelical or anglo-catholic now our press is also slanted heavily left and they will only focus on and highlight and bless so to speak uh, those democratic uh, policymakers who are ultra liberal and mm -hmm. when cortez makes the news she makes all the news 
um, and, and she's pr- you know put forward as the future of the Democratic Party, and that's part of the problem that you know the the moderates in the Democratic Party you know, I can't get any coverage from the news unless I kind of tilt even further left, and it makes for ugly politics, and you know this last. <laughs> Okay, uh, the entire last thousands and thousands of years of politics have been horrible, George. It's just getting worse. I wake up and I, you know, there's a scandal now because people who work for the Fed were trading stocks. That That's the news that's breaking today. Uh, in the time that uh, Biden has been president, it, Wall Street has been decimated. Uh, it, it's just, it's down so much. And now we're going to have, uh, I would say, a shock oil uh uh, price increase because it, we just have poor leadership. Now, I, I'm not saying Trump was a great leader, but in some places financially, he was an okay leader. So he was a different leader to be sure. All right. So let's talk a little bit about, is it over? Our next story talks about Uganda has announced that it's kind of opening post COVID. You and I were here talking in March and April and uh, May about how exciting it was to be uh, vaccinated and that COVID's finally over. We can see the, the, the future and the light at the end of the tunnel and uh, I'm ringing the all clear bell. Hey, no more worries. And then we hear about Delta. And we tighten down here again in America. Uh, the airline industry is still uh, decimated. Businesses aren't allowing people to come back. Um, it's still a mess uh, six months after we, we uh, gave the all clear. Uganda has been closed down for a while. They're now saying you can go back to church. And this may present well for all of Africa, George. Yes, the president of Uganda earlier this year, I believe it was in June, Mm -hmm. uh, could have been earlier this year, but it's been several months, shut the country down for all intents and purposes. No sporting events, no theatrical events, no movies, no churches, no mass gatherings uh, to halt the spread of COVID. And the Church Church of Uganda went along with this. There were some groups that fought this in the elite Ugandan court system, but that's gonna take so long it really is meaningless. And this past week, the and this past Sunday, the government allowed churches to reopen under certain social distancing guidelines. Uh, 50% capacity, no more than 200 people at a time with social distancing of six feet or one and a half meters, I believe. I don't know how long a meter is, but let's keep it. It's feet, three six feet. feet. Do. Yeah, come on. Okay. Three feet. Uh, the, uh, now, the, no. We've gone through several things like this in various parts of the United States. There have been those sorts of shutdowns, and we've had them in Florida as well. But those shutdown orders came from the bishop, not from the governor, because uh, the governor DeSantis, who's actually become more popular under COVID than he was before. Um, that's a side side note. We 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 shut down. We reopened. But the big major difference is is in Uganda and in Rwanda and Kenya and other church and other places in East Africa that have had to close doors because of COVID, they live week to week on their income. They li- they're like most Americans, they live on their paycheck. Mm-hmm. And when that paycheck isn't coming in, they're in big trouble. And in the Church of Uganda, the uh, income comes from the donations every Sunday. And if you miss one or two, you're in trouble. If you miss four or five months, people go hungry in the church. We read about some English diocese gave grants to the Church of Uganda to buy food for the clergy during this difficult period. And um, in in America, when we were shut down, um, we had, uh, our parish tries to keep about six to nine months cash on hand, meaning if everything stopped coming in, we could go for nine months. Um, We're fortunate. Uh, we don't have any uh, trust funds or anything like that. We just have the donations of the faithful. But America is a wealthier country than Uganda. Mm-hmm. And so we've been able to build up reserves. So part of the quiet, if you will, from the GAF, we need a f- the bigger picture. Part of the quiet of GAFCON is many of our primates are focused on the fact that they have no income streams. 
that their cash flow is completely shot. And they, how do they keep their churches alive as institutions when there's no income and no reserves and they're not going to run hat in hand to 815 or Trinity Wall Street. And ACNA, uh, ACNA for all its good works, does not have unlimited funds to send to Africa to support that church there. So a great deal of the energy and focus of the African church has been on survival. And the sort of the, the culture wars can wait till they're back on their feet again. Yeah. And we've seen this uh, in other African countries dealing with uh, radical Islam and uh, the Boko Haram that they, they have bigger fish to fry right now than what's going on in the, the, the greater Anglican church and certainly greater international politics. So We, we, we did a story about a, a recent murder in Nigeria of a priest who uh, allowed students to take uh, the national, the, you got Nigerian version of the SATs. Mm -hmm. And because he did this, separatists who want an independent Biafra or the Southeast Igbo region, they murdered him because they had said no businesses on this day. And he allowed the students to take their exams and they killed him. That's a more pressing concern for a, a Church of Nigeria bishop than what's happening in, in Manhattan or what's happening in San Francisco. Now, when times are good, then that sort of allows them to raise their head and look up at the bigger picture. But I think human nature is such that we, tr we, are, we attend to the immediate fire in front of us and worry about the raging forest fire next door after our own needs are addressed. And it should also be noted that the Anglican communion, the fabric of it, has been torn. And I think there's just under, an understanding that, that it's not repairable at this point in time. We're not going to put a whole lot of energy into trying to repair it. We're going to lean on GAFCON. We're going to lean on the Global South as our way forward. Although, if we see a way to repair the Anglican Communion in the future, we will be there. But we're not going to send off our press releases every time we hear something stupid come out of the Episcopal Church or something stupid come out of the uh, Canadian Church or another heresy from uh, a Latino church. We're not going to uh, sit here and just monitor the news of the blogs all day long. We have bigger fish to fry, and the Communion is broken. We know that. And we know that it is not fixable at this point. And I think that mentality you will find uh, in all the provinces and the certainly the archbishops. Uh, we can't sit here all day long worried about what the Episcopal Church is going to do next. Um, they've done, they've torn the fabric, and this is where we are now. And I think that's an important thing to remember. You know, why can't we hear from Nigeria every time something stupid happens over here? They're, they're tired of it. They're sick and tired of it. So, all right. So that's our that's our African story. We're moving on to the well. Maybe it's not the final story. It may lead into more stories. Uh, accountability in the ACNA. We published a story this week on Anglican Inc. that was sent to us. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up here um, by a viewer regular to uh, Anglican Inc. He said you need to see this. Is it coming up? Come on. Oh, it didn't even come up. Oh, well. Uh, you need to see this. This is uh, something that was forwarded to him, and he wants you to see it. A priest has decided that uh, he wants to take his parish out of the ACNA for the CEEC. George will tell you what that is in a minute. Uh, because he and his church no longer agree with the stance the ACNA have on same-sex marriages. And he's under a bishop somewhere, and that bishop didn't really do the right thing. That's another thing we could talk about. But we want to talk about the overarching theme here, about accountability and property and stuff within the ACNA. And it seems, George, that you can just take your church out of the ACNA if you want to. That's the what I get out of this letter. Yes, uh, the Reverend Danny Bryant, the rector of St. Mary of Bethany, Anglican Church in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm released a letter to his congregation, which we published on Anglican Inc., stating that the parish council, why can't they call these things by the right name? Call it's a vestry. vestry. Okay, I, my, my church has got the same problem. My church calls it the parish council, and their form of EMEA parish, and I think it was something done in rebellion years ago. We're not going to use vestry because vestries always go wrong. Okay, well, <laughs> the the... the the, the 
group formerly known as uh, Prince, now known as uh, Parish Council or Vestry, yes, has vo had voted to withdraw from the Diocese of C4SO, Christ for Serving Others? Christ uh, Christ for Others, uh, something like that, Christ Service for Others. And one of the strange uh, diocese names led by uh, Bishop Todd Hunter. Christ for, the, oh, it's they, Christ, Christ for the sake Christ of others. For yeah. Sake of others. Mm -hmm. And they would be transferring to the com uh, Communion of Evangelical Episcopal Churches, CEEC. And Mr. Bryant would be going from the ACNA clergy to the CEEC clergy. Mm -hmm. And the reason was they did not agree with the ACNA's stance on human sexuality. God was doing a new thing that Paul didn't really know about modern views of sexuality, of faithful same-sex relationships, and we believe that the church is called to support and bless people in these relationships. And so they're out. Mm -hmm. And the canons of the ACNA allow clergy to leave for theological reasons and to take the parish property with them. Now, that's so, in the by so This raises several issues. Well, I think that's several. in the bylaws because of the, the relationship with the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church wouldn't let you leave with your property. If you want your property, you're going to fight every, you know, every penny. Uh, you're going to spend every penny to keep your church. And we're going to fight you all the way. California is a great example. Uh, we will make sure that you will never have your day in court. You will file these uh, petitions. You will show that the Dennis Cannon obviously was not part of your church bylaws. Uh, you will show that neutral principles is truly in effect, but you will never, ever see your day in court. That's what happened in California. They just held this up in a process until the churches could no longer afford it. Mm -hmm. And so the ACNA in the rules said, listen, we don't want to have to go through that again. We're going to make it easier for a church to leave the ACNA or leave a diocese, uh, more specifically the diocese, uh, if it so desires. And this is, this is a positive development over the sort of overreaching that you saw in the Episcopal Church, where mm -hmm. the Dennis Cannon was created out of whole cloth in 1979, I think, mm -hmm. and imposed uh, a, the, a non-traditional understanding of how church property is owned and deployed. I think there was sometimes I think they may have gone too far because now there is no sense uh, that a bishop can hold his clergy accountable or prevent them from falling into error because the way the ACAA is set up is that if you fall into error, rather than being disciplined or straightened out by your bishop, you're free to go off and live out that error. So well, I don't, I, I, the, the it, balance isn't quite right, I think. And you're, and you're right. In the perfect church, if the ACNA were working as a whole, functioning at all levels, this, the headline would be, Defrocked Priest Seeks to Take His Church uh, to the CEEC from the ACNA. Um, if you are taking your church into what is well-known scriptural error, uh, reason error, traditional error, uh, this is a heresy to say that um, uh, Christ cannot transform the lives of people uh, who are in sexual conflict, uh, that is heresy. Therefore, if you want to lead your church down there and you want to sit down with your bishop and discern that, your bishop says, listen. We have a guide with us. We have the New Testament. We have Ephesians, Galatians. Mm -hmm. uh, we can work this out. Uh, we know what's worked in the past with the church, and we know what doesn't work. We know holding accountability within the church service, within the worship service, within the church leadership, within the greater uh, episcopate works. When we don't have that accountability, things go haywire, and we have a headline that says a priest who was not defrocked gets to take his church out of the ACNA. And, you know, I think the ball was dropped here clearly at the Episcopate level. And this is kind of, I think this is the first or second church that's left. How do we hold priests accountable? 
Now, if there's sexual sin, if this person, uh, you know, had committed sex outside of marriage or something like that, that's easily more accountable than these these errors in teaching. You know, this person is teaching a heresy within his church. He's taken his church outside the ACNA. Why was he not defrocked? Part of it is that you're always, when you have these new entities, such as the ACNA form, new being only 10 years old, which is in American sense is a, is a long established institution, but in the great scheme of history is a new new entity. You collect together all sorts of uh, odds and sods. So within the ACNA, for instance, you have some people in the very beginning who were bishops, who were brought in as bishops, who really had no business being bishops. Um, because they did not have this apostolic uh, uh, orders, and they well, I, I'll stop there. <laughs> yes. But the but the point is that you 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 bring in people into sort of a coalition, and you live with the imperfections, and hopefully over time you have a clergy clergy training scheme that overcomes these. Uh, theological uh, divisions or whatnot. So in this particular case, I don't think you had a priest who was very well trained theologically. He was a, a good pastor uh, in that he had a successful growing parish, but the, but that may be more due to his personality and his uh, uh, charisma not than to his uh, teaching handed on from the fathers. and. What you now see is that when you don't have good preparation, good teaching, solid formation of the clergy and of the lay people, you do have this heresy arise. Uh, and in this case, the heresy is that God is doing a new thing, that there are extra biblical revelations and that your rector can have one. Um, you know, let's go back to the beginning. Well, not to the beginning, but let's go back to the Gene Robinson affair. I ta I've talked to Gene Robinson many, many times. Uh, not recently, but during the height of this problem. And I have to say, Gene Robbins is a personable, nice, attractive individual. He's charismatic. He's fun to be around. He genuinely believes that God is doing a new thing in this area of human sexuality. And part of Gene's error is that he doesn't hold this against the standard of Scripture because he, in essence, I don't think had the training to know how to address that. And so it's not that Gene Robinson is a hypocrite, rather he's trying to be honest. And, and uh, this fellow, Danny Bryant, is not a hypocrite. In fact, I applaud his doing the right thing of leaving an institution of which he is not in, a, in full agreement with and going to one that he does agree with but this should have been stopped earlier on by yeah. adequate training information. Sure. And uh, now, this is a heresy that he's taking his whole church with him in. You know, and that's my problem is you're leading others astray. Uh, yeah, if you're astray and you want to go join another church where you think supports your beliefs, okay, whatever. Um, I'll pray for you and uh, I will uh, see you on your way. But when you're leading a congregation and you're leading them astray, uh, in his, his letter here, he says, My vision for this community, his church, is not for it to be a place where everyone must have the same belief over the theological ethics of marriage, uh, but rather that we could be a place where people who confess the resurrected Christ as Lord can come to Christ's table in love while working together for fidelity. Well, here's just a mishmash of words then. And just mercy in, in our neighbors and um, neighborhoods. Now, the, one of the most important teachings of Christ was the relationship between Christ and the church. And it, the analogy was that of marriage. Well, if you can't understand marriage, you'll never understand the relationship between Christ and the church. And, you know, where we, so I, I, I can't say that we need to minimize our understanding of marriage. That's ridiculous. Well, I think I think the Bible really is the answer to this, Kevin. You're absolutely right, and that what we have, uh, sound like Strother Martin. What we have here <laughs> is a failure happened? to understand the Bible, <laughs> because what we have is we have placing one part of the Bible 
in, in contradiction to another part. There is that passage, I believe Mark 9, uh, that, you know, if you're not with me, if you're not against me, you're with me. Uh, the disciple John asked Jesus, Jesus, these people were casting out demons in your name, name, yep, and they're not one of us, will you tell them to stop it? And Jesus says, no, nobody who does things in my name can then do evil. And in, in essence, this is a call for, uh, again, this is a plea against sectarianism, mm -hmm. that, you know, and traditionally it's said that we in the Episcopal Church have said that this means that Methodists aren't going to hell and Baptists aren't going to hell. We're all part of Christ's uh, workers in the world and we should not be so sectarian as to deny the efficacy of their pastoral work. Now somebody like Dandy, Dandy Bryant is taking that and transposing that into the teaching office saying just as Jesus said we shouldn't be sectarian we shouldn't basically be so harsh on marriage, but you can't propound one part of scripture where it says be uh, broad-minded to have it nullify the part where Paul says those who commit these acts will not be going to heaven. So in other words, you have to read scripture within the context of scripture, and that comes down to a lack of fundamental preparation training for the ministry, I believe. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we will see how this plays out. Um, I don't think he could destroy the CEEC anymore. That's kind of uh, a continuing body that has been split a million times. If yes, I... we've received an email from, evidently there are several CEECs. There's yes. the Continuing Evangelical Episcopal Church. There's mm -hmm. the Communion of Evangelical Episcopal Churches. And... There are several bodies, and some of them hold to traditional views on human sexuality, and they're mortified, frankly, because the same, the same CEEC, uh, what's that word acronym? Uh, uh, yeah, well, it's the communion. I, I, I'm looking in here at you know, just Google CEEC, and four or five different ones come up. So, in other words, they're being tarred by the bad acts of another group with the same initials, mm -hmm. and. The, uh, so they want to be quite clear that they're not this group, they're another group. Um, so it's a bit confusing and unfortunate, but uh, there you are. So uh, so please, Danny, return your parish to uh, a non-heretical teaching on marriage, for the love of God. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've seen this go bad so many ways, but no, God is not doing a new thing. No, it, 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 the resurrection is the newest thing God has done. The whole okay, technically the Holy Spirit is the newest thing God has done. But you know, I you know I've had, in one little personal anecdote, I've had three households, three families leave my parish over during the COVID period mm -hmm. to join other churches. Usually, people leave my church because they die or they move away. It's unusual for people to move to other churches. Mm -hmm. It's been my experience. And I've basically did exit interviews with them. And the one went to the Catholic Church, one went to the Lutheran Church, and one went to the Assemblies of God. You're, you're so such an speaks. ecumenical expert. <laughs> and all three families essentially said the same thing, that they came to our congregation because they were refugees from theirs. Mm -hmm. That they had such a bad, ex they were cradle Catholics, they grew up there, were part of that, they raised their children there, but if they just had a bad experience with Father X. They moved down here, friend invited them to come to our church, they came, they loved it, they became Episcopalians, but the Spirit was leading them to go back into their old Roman Catholic Church and to evangelize their dead Roman Catholic parish. And I got the same message from the people going back to the Lutheran Church and back to the Assemblies of God Church. And it's very difficult for me to say, oh, that's terrible, you shouldn't leave us, when their whole point is, your church reignited the fire that I once had in the faith I have in the gospel and in Christ, so as not to be wounded when the institution fails, but to go in and work for the turnaround of the institution. And I sometimes wish people who like say, oh, I'm going to the Catholic Church, or oh, I'm going to the CEEC, would rather work for the renewal of the place that they're in than pick up their marbles and walk away. 
But if they're within a certain entity, they need to understand why they're there and not try to change its rules, but work towards its renewal and revival and its growth. Yeah. I remember there, talk- I, I'll get off my soapbox. No, I'm going to be on my soapbox. I remember talking to a friend years ago who came out of a church that I just don't like it. I'm going to move churches. And I said, thank God they weren't worshiping you. You know, church worship is not about you. You're, you are honored to be a participant in worshiping God. And um, we as Western humans uh, think everything's about us. And I've seen that so many times in our current story and others uh, that, you know, we, we've lost focus on our worship is not about us, but it's about the living God. All right. So. That's that's accountability in the ACNA. We would hope that we could have uh, better story headlines because there was accountability at the episcopate level for the clergy. We'll see what happens in the future. Uh, to follow up story, I want to do. Uh, we talked about uh, Gafcon primates had a meeting a couple weeks ago. They said that uh, it's regrettable what Kenya did, but we're really not that type of organization where we can stop Kenya from. Uh, consecrating women bishops. Sorry. There's been a lot of good articles put out uh, and opinions on the internet that I will link to in this article. Phil Ashey put out a great response uh, to this, and I read one from Lee Nelson that I want to put in the show notes. Um, it's good that people understand what GAFCON was originally put together for. That, you know, they agree with George and I that it was it was to conquer these types of issues. It was to deal with a little bit of uh, accountability within GAFCON. They're accountable to when a, a archbishop goes um, financially rogue. Why can't they be accountable when a province goes rogue on uh, issues? Oh, it's, it's not a salvation issue. Well, George, if you can go rogue on women's issue, why can't you go rogue on same-sex marriage? Why can't you go rogue on um, the Trinity? Go rogue on other things. Why can't you do what Father Danny did and say, listen, we just aren't going to uh, talk that much about marriage anymore because uh, people have trouble dealing with their sexuality and it really isn't a big deal because God is doing something new. Is not God doing something new the argument that is going to take down GAFCON. Could very well be, because it's the argument that took apart the Episcopal Church. Hmm. That there are new revelations uh, that need to be followed, uh, not just the old-time religion that we've received from our forefathers and foremothers. Mm -hmm. Um, Basically, Kevin, there's no reason why we shouldn't become Mormons if we're allowed to have these extra, or Muslims, if we're allowed to have these extra biblical revelations to guide our thinking and thoughts. The uh, Todd Atkinson, the tallest bishop in the ACNA, uh, is the the review of the Upper Midwest Diocese has now been expanded to include a review of Bishop Atkinson. And we've been sent copies of some of the complaints. And the complaints uh, deal with the fact that Bishop Atkinson has expressed some extra biblical revelations that if you're in his, under him, you need to obey him because the Lord, Lord has spoken to him about these things. Well, that, I'm not saying that Bishop Atkinson holds the same views as Gene Robinson, but the same methodology, the same way of thinking that God has given me a special revelation mm-hmm. is, is at work here. And that, I don't believe, is true. Um, I think Mm -hmm. scripture is sufficient unto itself. And when you start adding your own uh, words that the Lord is telling you, that's when we get in big, big trouble. Yeah, we do. Uh, It's amazing. Okay. (sighs) Going to answer the email I get the most this last week. Kevin, did you know that George is up to be bishop of a diocese. And I said, oh, I guess we're going to have to talk about it. Kevin, what will happen to Anglican.inc and Anglican Unscripted if George starts wearing purple? I guess we have to talk about that too. But we're going to talk about it not in the context that we're campaigning here for George. We're going to talk about this in the context that uh, through the reality of uh, life, 
we do changes. Uh, Kevin, a year ago, was it a year ago? No, okay, a year and a half ago, was not sitting in an RV. COVID allowed me and my business uh, uh, empire expansion uh, and Jill to li live and work from the road. It was a reality that we took advantage of. Um, in, in searching out is God in this, it, it's kind of amazing the people we meet and get to share our faith with. And uh, I'm amazed I get to share my faith more in this context than I did in the last five years in, in my last context. It, it, it's, it's, it's a situational thing I don't understand, but if God wants to use this opportunity, all right, use me, I will be your servant. The same with George. George is like, does God want me to use me in this context? It's an exploration. But George, people want to know, if you became a bishop anywhere, what would happen to Anglican Dodic and Anglican Unscripted? You'd have to get a filter to sort of uh, change the color of my shirt to yes. a neutral color. So. <laughs> neutral. <laughs> no, uh, some people collect stamps. Some people uh, chase women. Uh, I do Anglican unscripted. Anglican. <laughs> it, it doesn't cut into my work hours. Far from it. Mm -hmm. No, I have no intention of. Uh, I am who I am, uh, and uh, I seek to be faithful to the Lord's leading. Mm -hmm. I'm very uncomfortable talking about this whole process because I don't wish to be seen as campaigning because I have an abhorrence of campaigning for Episcopal office because I think it is just so vulgar, so contrary to God's will that you should be acting like a politician. Um, so I, I really am not comfortable saying anything more other than that I seek to be faithful to the Lord's leading. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll probably make less money. Um, uh, believe me, I, uh, more headaches, not, more stress, more headaches. I have to buy new clothing. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife will need winter outfits now. Uh, the cat will have to learn what the cold is like if we move. Um, but the I'm being silly, but I'm not a careerist. If I were, I would have never left business world 30 years ago. Sure. But rather, I seek to serve God where he wants me to be. And we just need to, Susan and I, need to be faithful Yeah, and I think to that cult leading of the Spirit. You know, if you are the same person you were five years ago and 10 years ago and 20 years ago, then you're not growing and you're not exploring uh, ways in which uh, God can use you. And uh, uh, that's kind of disappointing to, to watch so many people you know who are just there they get up and they, they do their nine to five uh and nothing changes and that's not the way especially if you look uh through biblical history that god intended us to be you know we were intended to be uh daily worshipers of the living god and to participate fully in creation and I don't think the, the nine to fives and uh, being um, in that Western context of uh, affluence is what God desired. And, mm. and I think we see the people who have the greatest faith have the least of things. And uh, it's gonna be interesting to watch. We'll see what happens. And no, we will not uh, campaign. The, the only thing we, we will probably see is an uptick in viewership uh, if, if you become bishop. So, that well, yeah, because then, then I'll be able to uh, tell you about uh, what really happened at the House of Bishops meeting. Yes. Instead of hearing it secondhand, I'll have firsthand coverage. First hand, yes. <laughs> Another meeting I had to sleep through. No quitting. Okay. So, that's uh, George's uh, um, news. And uh, we'll certainly uh, keep you guys uh, informed, See, you know. Uh, well, let me just say out loud uh, what I've been feeling in my heart. I, I have this sense that revival is about to break out in our nation and in our churches. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Lord, Jesus came from, not from Jerusalem, but from Bethlehem and from Nazareth, the least of the places. You know, is, is the, what, what has ever come out of Nazareth? Uh, is as a biblical uh, question and so i think revival will start in places 
uh, like in the Midwest, in northern Florida, it's not going to start at the heart of the institutions. It's going to start with ordinary people doing extraordinary things because the power of Christ is within them. Hmm. And just as we saw the Welsh revival 200 years ago, we'll see similar revivals, I believe, in the years to come. I hope and I believe and I pray in the United States. And um, God loves fools, drunks in the United States of America. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> what happens. Uh, yeah, that'll be the quote of the week. <laughs> All right. So that's our show for this week. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 688 of Anglican Unscripted.